In Sonic Heroes, the greatest Sonic game ever made, we get a brief introductory cutscene that establishes Sonic, his teammates Tails and Knuckles, their dynamic with each other, their individual character traits, and Eggman's plan to conquer the world in three days. As we proceed through the Team Sonic campaign, we get brief cutscenes that establish the level, and their progress towards stopping the ticking clock that is Eggman's plan. There's even a twist in the middle of the campaign, where Eggman, seemingly announcing his plan like a buffoon, was simply a diversion to launch his actual plan. Not to mention cute little callbacks and references to previous games to make it feel like part of the same continuity. This isn't like Shakespearean writing or anything, but there's a good grasp on creating a narrative that complements the gameplay. That cutscene is one minute long. In Sonic Forces, we get a cutscene about half the time that establishes one thing and one thing only. Eggman bad. <laughs> the boss means business this time. Uh -huh. Did Eggman not mean business when he literally blew up the planet, when he roboticized a mini planet, or when he threatened Earth with a giant laser by blowing up the moon with it, or when- I bet it sounds very pedantic and stupid to get like, frustrated at a Sonic game story. But if you think about it, even the most basic platforming stories seem to understand providing a narrative to keep the player invested. The first Mario Bros has you rescuing Princess Peach. Every level, the princess is in another castle, and you gotta keep going and rescue this fucking bitch. A brief aside. Mario Galaxy probably utilizes this simple concept of rescue princess the best, and manages to establish the story in a very epic way. You get very immersed in this adventure as you go on a galaxy-wide mission to rescue your bear. God, that joke was awesome, I'm so fucking cool. But that's the key word there, immersed. A simple story doesn't have to be a bad thing. When you play Sonic 1, you're not thinking about it consciously, but subconsciously, you're speeding through levels and wanting to stop Dr. Robotnik from taking over these beautiful landscapes. And when you see Sonic running back through Green Hill at the very end, using the Chaos Emeralds to bring all the life back to it, you feel accomplished. It's a 16-bit video game with a very simple premise, but it's super effective. And yet, somehow, we have a triple A game, on a shovelware budget, in the year 2017, with nice, shiny, high-definition graphics, voice acting, Hollywood writers behind it, and somehow we get a story that has a complete mess of ideas, that takes you out of it by making you ask more questions about very basic things. Why is Green Hill more like Sand Hill? Why am I escaping the Death Egg by leaving it and then going back into it afterwards? Within the context of the game world, why is the giant worm from the lost hex there in the background but doesn't do anything? Why don't I get to interact with that? Among so many others. A big problem with Sonic Forces is that there's no real narrative cohesion with its story and gameplay. While there are a lot more important things to a platforming game than its narrative, a good narrative, whether simple or complex, can enhance the gameplay dramatically, because it gives you context for doing what you're doing, other than run through level and get good greed. Again, I'm not saying the story needs to be deep or complex, or even really there, but Sonic Team is clearly trying to harken back to stories like Adventure 2 and Unleashed, where there's high stakes and thrills, and they feel miserably. If there was an attempt and it fails, it's worth addressing and criticizing, and we're going to do just that, in excruciating detail. Explaining how they faltered and why that's an epic feel. Can I get a true dat? True dat. Hmm. To start, I'll summarize Sonic Forces with no jokes, asides, or any sort of witty remarks. Just a thorough plot summary. The game begins with Eggman saying he hits Sonic. Literally. And then we see Sonic running through Green Hill to help Tails with an assault Eggman has launched. As we see Teal's car in fear with random civilians, Sonic appears to save them. We then meet Infinite, along with Chaos, Zavik, Metal Sonic, and Shadow, who seemingly heel turned. Sonic is then beaten thoroughly as Teal's hides behind a rock. We get a little screen that says six months has passed and Eggman has conquered the world, Sonic is believed to be dead, and Teal's has reportedly lost it. We then meet a new Resistance member, the Player Avatar. Rouge informs the team that Sonic is indeed alive but is being tortured on the Death Egg. Eggman's endgame is for Sonic to be banished into the far reaches of space. The Avatar, dubbed Rookie, then proceeds to help the Resistance in a successful rescue mission. Meanwhile, Teals has been trying to fix Omega, when Chaos Zero slowly walks towards him, causing Teals to, once again, cower in fear. Then, out of nowhere, Classic Sonic appears from a wormhole and bonks Chaos Zero. This is apparently not Sonic from the past, but from another dimension? Teals regains hope and sets out with Classic Sonic, forming a friendship, and eventually learning that Eggman has a plan to wipe everyone out in three days. Meanwhile, Silver fights Infinite, and Sonic comes in to give him a hand, but feels, as Sonic tries to figure out what the source of Infinite's power is. The rookie finds some readings of a power, and picks up a gemstone. 
Classic Sonic and Teals meet up with the Rookie, and they all head back to the Resistance base to meet up with everyone. Sonic then meets back up with Shadow in the city, and learns that it is indeed a faker. The real Shadow dispatches him as Sonic puts his hand up in a cowardly defense, you know, as he's known to do. We then learn that the power Infinite yields is the Phantom Ruby, a power that can make virtual reality copies of anything the wielder desires, ostensibly giving Eggman an infinite army. Okay. Knuckles decides it's now or never and launches a huge assault on one of Eggman's bases, only for 80% of the entire resistance to be wiped out by Infinite's power. Meanwhile, the rookie is confronted by Infinite, but his power gets countered by the mysterious gemstone the rookie picked up earlier which turns out to be a Phantom Ruby prototype. The Resistance decides that the Phantom Ruby needs to be stopped in order to have any chance to win the war, so Sonic and Teal's attempt to find its power source, which is the Death Egg's core. Classic Sonic then blows up the Death Egg, Sonic and Teal's plan to launch an assault on Eggman, but fail, and Sonic gets sucked into Null Space, along with the Avatar. They double boost out of it, and confront Eggman one last time, before he escapes and prepares for the endgame. The Resistance confront them at Eggman's final base, where it's revealed that Eggman's plan is to make a virtual reality copy of the Sun and burn everyone who is affected by it. The Rookie uses the Phantom Ruby prototype to neutralize it, Omega shoots gun at Infinite, and then Sonic and the Rookie tussle with the Jackal one last time before he leaves. Bye bye Infinite, he was never seen again. Eggman then uses a huge Death Egg robot again, as Classic Sonic, Sonic, and the Avatar fight him together. They succeed, Eggman loses, Classic Sonic returns to his home planet, the rookie goes off to do wh whatever, and then Sonic runs. The end. I could go over the many countless plot holes, oversights, inconsistencies, lazy hand waves. You know how the pacing makes no sense because the game basically just goes, okay, go here and destroy the death egg, and then the next level you destroy the death egg, and I go here and destroy the weapons bay, and then you go over there and destroy the weapons bay, you know, it makes it seem like it's no problem at all for resistance, but, you know, I'm not going to talk about any of that. But I really want to focus on one major plot point, the Phantom Ruby. In Sonic Mania, the Phantom Ruby is unearthed in Angel Island. It mostly just teleports the characters to different levels to justify the anniversary celebration. In Sonic Forces, however, a game that takes place in the same continuity and is a direct sequel to Mania, the Phantom Ruby is an Eggman-built thing that can do anything the plot wants. It can make mind-controlled clones, it can make you think and feel something that's not really there, it can trap you in a different reality entirely. There are like 12 different prototypes, it can make a fake sun that only certain people can feel. What the fuck is this stupid thing? The problem is there's no real narrative consistency here. They are constantly changing how characters feel, their agency, what a major plot element can do, and even the world building itself. We go through like five different zones and most of them don't even feel like they belong together. The overall direction in this game is a total fucking disaster. And by the way, before we move on, can I just mention how out of character our main characters are in this game? And that could have worked entirely in its favour. Knuckles is now this super serious general of the army. Amy is almost like a tech girl, taking over the role of Teals using computers and such. Team Chaotix are doing like infiltration work and Rouge is like a proper spy. Again, this is so out of character, but I don't think that was intentional. They could have reworked this entirely in their favour by implying that it's the six months passing that's caused this change. We could have seen how each character adapted with war. Maybe Teals is a little more jaded after the loss of Sonic and is squarely focused on getting his revenge on Eggman. How about you even, like, change up the character appearances to reflect this war, instead of having Amy be in this bright pink dress? Or giving Vector his gold chain and fucking headphones? I recall one of the driving factors behind Sonic Boom, being that Sega wanted more variety in the marketing of the Sonic characters, since you can only really make an action figure out of the same character a couple times before it starts getting a bit boring. So how about giving the main cast updated appearances for this one game? Th that would have been cool to see, and it would have justified the sudden change in character motivation and personalities. It's just, let's chalk that up to another missed opportunity in Sonic Forces. What are we at, like, like 50 now? Every Sonic game has a distinct, cohesive art style. Even something like Sonic 06 is a consistent art style, even if based on a poor misguided idea. Even Generations, a game that has the unfortunate task of making all these disparate artistic designs coalesce into something more unified, manages to pull it off pretty well. So how does Forces fuck it all up? The problem is immediately apparent in the first level. Green Hill looks a lot more like Sand Hill, right? 
except it doesn't. It looks like they had dumped sand and then desaturated the textures here in order to make it seem dilapidated and dead. If you were to split this level into three narrative acts, <laughs> you can see them attempting to form a narrative in the level. It starts with Green Hill as we know it, except with elements of sand and decay. Then Act 2 shows the decay taking over, and by Act 3, Green Hill is a husk of its former self, foreshadowing the danger to come. This would work if 10 sieges later, we didn't come back and Green Hill looks relatively fine later in the narrative, instead of decayed even further. Then we go back again with the Avatar and Sonic, and then again with just the Avatar. There's very minor callbacks here and there to reflect your progress, which I'll discuss later, but it doesn't feel like I'm progressing in any meaningful way. I'm revisiting this stage theme multiple times and I feel like I'm getting nothing done, in spite of the narrative telling me, oh look, we're really doing a number on Eggman's hold of the world, oh boy. It's so bad at conveying this that they literally had to show you a progress bar to get the point across, which, by the way, comes in halfway through the game and keeps shooting up instantly with no real rhyme or reason. In the first stage, Sonic alludes to having to clean up Green Hill. Wouldn't it feel way more satisfying to see Green Hill get so thoroughly destroyed, but then later when you've replayed it after making significant progress, it starts to look more as we remember it, maybe even better? Instead of it just consistently looking the same in spite of the game's narrative telling you that Eggman has completely fucked up the world, Green Hill Zone looks the exact same before Eggman took over the world, and then the six months after he accomplished it. In fact, no, it looks better because there's way more sand in the Sonic level, but I guess that would just be unreasonable and way too much work. It should just stay simple like the classic games. Instead of sticking to Sonic's traditional style of gameplay, we decided to design the game to be as simple and enjoyable as possible, focusing more on the excitement of dashing through the stages, without having to think about, you know, complex game controls. You know, classic games like Sonic CD. In that game, if you didn't travel through time to destroy the roboticizers, the final level of that zone would look completely desolate and ruined. Oh, and if you destroyed projectors of Metal Sonic, the animals would come back and fill the level with life. And if you do all that, the level's end title card said you made a good future and reflected all the work you put in. Oh, I guess they have done this before. Man, the classics were a lot more thematically and narratively thought out than people gave it credit for, huh? But you see, the cool thing is, you made that happen, and it was through gameplay. It made you feel like you had influence and that your lack of actions had tangible consequences to the world. This was a fucking Sega CD game in 1993. Even the loading screens give you a world map to see where the zones were in relation to each other. It was really cool. Now Sonic Forces tries to do this, but the world map is like so stylized to the point where you can't even really tell how these desperate level themes come together in the context of the world. One level you're in a burning little town, then apparently like two minutes away, is this gigantic sprawling green hill desert with a completely different looking ecosystem. Why are there lego trees, and realistic trees, and the green hill zone palm trees in the same game? Why is there checkerboard soil, and then like this mario looking soil in the same areas? What this, this sounds like nitpicking, but if you're going to make a world with a wide and varied ecosystem, you have to take into account these stylistic decisions. A game like Minecraft has multiple mineral types, biomes, and more, and it manages to blend them together very well due to a cohesive art direction. Or even to compare to another Sonic game, Unleashed has a very similar theme to Forces in traveling around the world trying to put a stop to Eggman, but that game takes time to try and make each location feel like a living and breathing place, and manages to make them each look visually distinct, while at the same time creating and expanding this world. Now I imagine after playing through Missouri and Sonic Unleashed, the next stage had you running through a cartoony green hill zone. Yeah, it'd look fucking stupid and take you out of the immersion. And speaking of said immersion, I'd like to bring up how literally nothing in this game screams, a world ruled by Eggman. Even in games where we didn't have control of the world, he'd stick his fucking mug everywhere. On rocks, on platforms, on lights, on doors. But in the one game where it would make complete sense for every level to be themed around Eggman, there is nothing like that. Imperial Tar is the most boring Eggman base in the entire series, because nothing about it points to it belonging to him. This all could have been a lot easier to swallow if the levels had any sort of transition between each other. When we see Sonic running out of the first level, Lost Valley, we don't see Sonic running towards Sunset Heights off in a distance, he just keeps running through the ruined Green Hill Zone. They have these large levels that get split into teeny chunks. Hell, Sunset Heights is like a gigantic level that's reused multiple times. Here's a side by side of Sonic and the Avatar Sunset Heights stage. Now, now here's Shadow's Sunset Heights stage. The geometry is largely the same, yet Sonic's level just ends out of nowhere and the Avatar's just keeps going. Why? What's the purpose? Why are they splitting these huge levels into tinier ones? To pad out the game's narrative? 
you know, the sprawling, sweeping narrative that we're clamoring for. Like an adventure on Unleashed. To go back to Unleashed, that game has the benefit of having small hub worlds where you can get to know the inhabitants of each nation, and see them traveling to and fro as you fix the planet. You'll see someone from one country wanting to travel to another, but because of the broken planet, they can't. But then you fix it and they go and achieve their dreams. It's awesome. It feels like I'm progressing. But Forces doesn't have that. We're told information, instead of the game having us seek out and do it for ourselves. I'm not saying that each level had to have a hub world, but being able to walk around the resistance base at least would have been a neat detail. Instead of having it be one room with a computer, maybe you have multiple rooms you can talk to the resistance and see how they're feeling about each part of the story. Alternatively, you could have animal capsules in the levels that have citizens inside, and they show up in the resistance space after you rescue them. Maybe if you rescue enough, you get a good ending. You know, like Sonic CD. You don't feel like you're building a resistance base. It's already built for you. Even if it feels really haphazard and the characters seem to really be grasping at straws and on their last legs. Wouldn't it be much better to have like one or two of Sonic's friends be in hiding and then they have to rescue Sonic on their own? And then you rescue the townspeople through gameplay to build up your army and base? Is that too much to ask? I'm not asking for like Metal Gear Solid 5 levels of base building here. But the least they could have done is let me walk around their resistance room and see my progress reflected as it fills up more. Maybe have that stupid title screen with the flower actually be walked around. Maybe the base is dusty and empty and all that's left is the flower. It would feel really nice to see the journey your home base goes through until it's not needed anymore. But nah, IGN said the hub worlds were bad. The lack of any interest in gameplay narrative is compounded by the fact that even the levels themselves don't compare the story well either. Your avatar character has all the abilities unlocked from the get-go, and any sort of perk that later Wispawn levels get is unneeded at best and detrimental at worst. Like how when you land sometimes your character will just sprint off in the distance off a cliff, like that's not, that's not an upgrade saga. But I can still play through the levels just fine without them. I don't have any sort of issue and the Wispawns have infinite ammo, so I seem to be plowing through robots no problem. It's what we in the video essay community like to call, um, lube of narrative distance. The fuck? When making a platforming game, it's important to remember that the levels have two separate narratives going on. The overarching narrative and the level to level narrative. But going back to Super Mario Bros, the overarching narrative is rescuing Princess Peach, but the level to level narrative can be broken down into three stories. Reaching the castle at the end of a level to reclaim it for the Mushroom Kingdom, or by beating Bowser at the end of every world, there's even level transitions at times. Comparing this to Sonic 1, we can see this type of level to level narrative being implemented, but in a different way. While the structure is the same, instead of having each level be its own mini-narrative, each zone gets progressively more industrial, to show how much closer you are to confronting Dr. Robotnik and reclaiming the nature of the world. Many of Sonic's games to come would follow this, the most successful of the classics being the aforementioned Sonic CD, where how well you played would affect each and every level's aesthetics. And then I point to Sonic 3 for having the most cohesive story and slick presentation. So. You know, they, they did a good job there. I could go on about each individual game, but I don't really feel like making a 7-hour video, so I'm going to skip straight to Generations, Lost World, and Forces. Starting with Generations, the game takes place in an amalgamated hub, where you slowly have to rebuild the timeline. Each level has a nice self-contained narrative. Green Hill Act 2 has a nice underground tunnel that transitions into the second part of the act, and the gold ring is located in a nice beautiful bed of flowers. Chemical Plant Act 1 has you running through normally as classic Sonic, and then Act 2 has modern Sonic destroying it. A nice callback to his original thematics. These are just a few examples out of a laundry list. Like I didn't even touch upon City Escape and Seaside Hill and how fucking cool those levels are. But then Sonic Lost World decided to have a more traditional approach to its level structure. Just plops you on a world map. Each world has four zones. Yeah, they're called zones and not acts, don't question it. And every two zones ends with a boss fight. Since the stakes in Lost World are nowhere near as high as a game like Forces, the simple approach works perfectly, you know, it gets the player in the flow of it all. The only area I think Sonic Lost World falls flat for me is in its level transitions. With it over-relying way too much on Sonic entering a black void, then fading back to an entirely different location. But even that is a way better of handling it compared to what Sonic Forces does. Nothing. There are no transitions in the slightest, because each and every level except for like, I don't know, Null Space I guess, has no transitions to speak of because the levels are so short that there's no room to feature any kind of cool location or set piece, unless you want to count like, the snake and luminous forest or the j ship section and whatever the fuck that level was called. In an attempt to look like I'm a balanced and nuanced YouTuber that is completely unbiased, I'm going to talk about every positive level to level narrative in Sonic Forces. The first one, Lost Valley. While I did criticize this level earlier, it at least shows some sort of narrative progression, even if poorly. 
Teals tells you you're needed in the city, and you travel through progressively decaying green hills before Sonic says, All right, I'm going to the city now. It's, uh, it's, um, it's there, I guess. Oh, then there's Capital City, where the Resistance is about to launch a surprise assault before Infinite Jab and Curb Stomps them. You don't, like, directly feel the Resistance getting Curb Stomped or anything. He kind of just messes with the gravity of the level and sets traps. It's probably the best example of this, but still not very expansive or too interesting. Then there's, um... Uh... Arsenal Pyramid has you go into a pyramid. Um, and the net... And the network terminal has you, um... Oh, oh, you, you go to computers. Imperial Tar has you go up Tar to stop the fake sun from exploding and killing everybody by making their bodies think they're going to be eviscerated by the fake sun, but if their bodies think it's real, then uh, they'd be eviscerated anyway because the sun is super, super hot, and I really fucking wish that the Phantom Ruby was better explained. God, I think that's about it for positives. You know what's really frustrating? In the positives I listed, they still fuck those up. Arsenal Pyramid's whole goal is for you to destroy the pyramid, right? You run through Green Hill, get in this pyramid, and then the level just... ends. And after the fact, you get the text box saying you destroyed it. How come I myself don't get to destroy it? There should at least be a boss fight or something. At the very least, have it be like Chemical Plant in Generations, where the level is like, destroying itself around you. Why not continually show me progressing my way in the war against the Egg Boy? The most we see of this Arsenal Pyramid level followed up is in Guardian Rock, where we see a tiny fire with billowing smoke. Wow, I sure did do a number on that pyramid. Oh, and you get to see the Death Egg blow up in a cutscene later in the game with all those civilians you didn't see still trapped on it. They're just dead. Bye. It is nice to see and travel out and into the Death Egg. That only lasts like five seconds, and does nothing interesting with the idea of Sonic platforming across Eggman's floating construction sites or aircrafts. You escape the Death Egg only to go back in to escape again. Why doesn't the whole level just take place in there then? This is way too grandiose for the fourth level of the entire game, and probably should have just been cut entirely. Instead, we have the Avatar free the prisoners, including Sonic, then Zavik attempts to kill them, only for Sonic to step in and have the Zavik boss fight. Then they all escape together in a cutscene. It solves a lot of the issues and eliminates a lot of dev time spent on boring cul-de-sac levels. They could have been used for better things. Maybe make the Wisp on a better gimmick in that time? Please? This may be controversial considering Sonic fans seem allergic to this word, but I think an extremely important aspect of making a fun and interesting Sonic level are gimmicks. And to be fair, I don't blame Sonic fans for hating the idea of gimmicks, because most of the time when Sega implements them, they're awful and add nothing to Sonic's core gameplay. For example, the Wisps. They're very intrusive and sort of force you into this stop and go deal where you pick up a Wisp, use its dumb, usually slow situational gimmick for 10 seconds, then go back to rolling around at the speed of sound. They work in color since I'd say that's more of a puzzle platformer, but in later entries, Sonic Team makes it clear they have no clue why they worked in that game. What was the point of this one? Can we talk about this one, please? Who, who thought this was fun? I bet you did, yeah. To me, the best kinds of Sonic games naturally incorporate the gimmicks into the level design, and a great way to make a level stand out is to give each stage a number of specific gimmicks and enemies, so it doesn't just feel like you're doing the same thing each and every time just with a different backdrop. Like in Sonic Forces. Oh boy, Sonic Team sure must be glad a Sonic game didn't come out a couple months before Forces that did all of that. Oh wait. It's amazing how a game can feel so bloated and attempt to tackle so many ideas and still feel completely distilled, empty, and void of content. They want to tell a big story with as little effort as possible. Even simple things like Sonic's animations are reduced to standing there, and one homing attack recoil that looks like he's more so struggling with the blowback than handling it with style like in other games. It's a shame, really, because this game is brimming with so much potential, and its mediocrity is while it feels so... gross. There's no scope. No grand scale of adventure or thrills. It just feels like a poorly written episode of a Sonic TV show, where we get to play a few minutes at a time. We go through this adventure that's so poorly told, we feel like we didn't accomplish a damn thing. It would have actually been nice to have an epilogue level running through cleaned up Green Hill Zone. Maybe have Sonic say, off to the next adventure. Instead, the credits is just a clip show of levels, still destroyed by the way, to a super hokey song. There's a lot of ways this game could have been salvaged. Could have been one of the greats. But honestly, it doesn't even feel worth it to try and think about what could have been. Chalk another one up to experience, I guess. As of the time writing this, the next Sonic game hasn't been revealed yet, and likely won't be until sometime in 2021. And all I'm left wondering... Is it gonna be as disappointing as Sonic Forces?